Good afternoon, everyone, and thank you for choosing Across the Fence. I'm Will Michael in this afternoon for Judy Simpson. It's the middle of August, and a common question around Vermont this time of year is, how's your garden going? Well, if you're like me, certainly some questions have come up, and you're wondering about perhaps a certain bug in your vegetable garden or a particular pest in your flower beds. So today I'm joined by two experts to help answer our late August gardening questions. It's always a pleasure to welcome Leonard Perry and Ann Hazelrig from UVM Extension and the University's Plant and Soil Science Department. Good afternoon. Thank you both Hi. for coming in. Yeah, thanks again, Will. Leonard, I'm going to start directly with you. We've got a lot of examples to get through. Tell us about some of the flowers that you brought in. Okay, well, as you know, I do uh, some research on hardiness on plants and uh, perennials in particular and some of the newer ones. And, of course, there are a lot of new cone flowers in recent years. Um, you see them. They're beautiful. Yeah, and a lot of them aren't that hardy, though. A couple uh, winters ago, I had 100 going into winter. 50 came out. Last winter I had 60 going in, about 30 came out living. And so these are some of the real good performers. Of course, some okay. of the... So these old, are the ones that are hardy. These are some of the ones that are hardy. There's the traditional purple cone flower. This uh, purple one here is a cultivar of that called Ruby Giant. It's a little bit bigger. And another classic one is this white one here called White Swan. Traditional with a cone in the center, hence cone flower. Um, those are great for pollinators too. They know what they're get getting. Here, the, some of these new ones that are real frou frou kind of in the center here, they have no clue. The pollinators really don't like that, the bees and such. And this is called secret lust. But if you want a nice ornamental, again, realize that some of these are short lived, but this one has led a couple of really tough winters. One of my favorite, though, is this one. It's a sombrero series called Sombrero Salsa Red. Comes out this nice pretty red, white underneath the petals. I beautiful. love that contrast. Yeah. And then ends up a nice fire engine red, a whole plant of that. That's been hardy for several years for me. Sombrero okay. salsa red. It's just a really okay. nice cone flower. Now, so just to confirm, the key thing for a consumer would be to look at hardiness before you end up maybe like you did. And a lot of 30%. people don't know that. Yeah, yeah. a lot of growers right. don't know. So that's okay. one reason I'm doing these tests and putting it on my website. We'll give it the end. Okay. Now we're also in the middle of fair and field day seasons. This is a time for uh, the fun stuff, the giant vegetables, but it's also flowers for the fair. And so what are some of the tips you would have for folks that want to take something into their fair and field? Yeah, well, day? a lot of people think, oh, well, you know, I'm not an expert, so I really shouldn't enter, but you'd be surprised. You know, pick some of your best flowers, follow the, the directions, and you may just be surprised, you know. So uh, again, it says two, you know, one stem, you put two, that'll be disqualified. Cut the flowers just before they open or as they're opening, they'll last longer and avoid any insects and diseases. The sunflowers I brought here, for instance, this one, um, and with more common ones like this, we see a lot of, um, they, they tend to be judged a little bit tougher, but you know, this is missing a petal or two. Um, it also has some insect chewing on this petal, so that's, that would help, you know, keep it from getting a, a blue ribbon. Um, again, numbers of stems for vase. This one has insect damage and disease on the leaves, uh, you just want to pick those off. Basically what the yeah. judges don't see, they can't judge. You answered so, my question. And I want to be clear, <laughs> our viewers are getting advice directly from this is what you do in part during fair and field day season. So uh, I want to say when, when you tell us and give us this advice, these are the things that make a difference whether we bring home a, a fun ribbon or exactly. not. Exactly. And when you have leaves, take them off, don't put them in the water either because that helps spoil the water okay. and flowers don't last as long. Excellent tips. Let me bring Ann Hazelrig into our discussion. Good afternoon again, Ann. You're in charge of the UVM Plant Diagnostic right, Lab, and right. it's really the front lines for reporting, particularly on the commercial right. uh, growing side and right. supporting Vermont horticulture. What are the issues that you're currently seeing, Ann? Well, Leonard always gets to bring the pretty stuff. Yeah, I, always get, <laughs> I get to bring the bad stuff. Um, <laughs> Something that's uh, shown up in the last week or two, which is a new disease on basil. We've had it actually since about 2008, but it's very destructive on basil. Um, it's called basil downy mildew. And what happens is your basil, all of a sudden, we found this in Burlington last week, and now it's on, on our campus. But the top of the basil leaf starts looking yellow, like it's a nutritional. I'm just gonna turn this a little bit for our director. Yeah, like it's a nutritional yeah. deficiency, but if you turn that leaf and look on the underside, you'll see this sort of dirty sporulation, and those are the spores of the fungus. And it really, as soon as it shows up, it's going to wipe out your basil. Yeah, and again, you're pointing, uh, Adam, our director Adam Wright has that, and we can see 
uh, some of that. So yeah, it's, a, it's a discoloration and a, and a wilting. You describe what it is. Is there anything that we can do about well, this? Well, it's not really a wilt, but discoloration, and then yeah. these spores, and okay. then it'll, yeah, it'll wipe it out. Well, at, once it shows up, no, there's no, not there's much not. to do. I, you know, it'd be okay. best to bag your basil and get it out of the garden. Okay. But I guess what I'm, we've seen this every year about yeah. this time of year, so I'm recommending that people really sort of front load their basil season, and if you want to make pesto, do it earlier in the season before this disease yeah. shows up. Yeah. Now you have something alongside here on these flowers, and the, oh, yeah. I believe I the issue yeah. is uh, uh, they're moving. <laughs> yeah, I guess I won't turn this into the fair. Probably I'm trying no. to win a prize. <laughs> Reject it at once. Yeah. Uh, these were some uh, black-eyed Susans. It's, I don't know what are these called. Yeah, the glory. Yeah. Yeah. Okay, yeah, but they're case, infested yeah. with aphids. Yeah. All along the stem. And that's what, again, our viewers can see. Those are those black spots all the way up and down. Right. Uh, we can't get close enough. They're, they're actually alive. They're moving around. Oh, yeah, they're yeah. moving around, yeah. and they're sucking plant juices, yeah. and they'll just weaken the plant yeah. and make it not look so good. Okay. People can use horticultural uh, or insecticidal soap yeah. if they want to control the aphids. Yeah. Now, there's another issue that uh, I'm not the only one to raise it. I, I did uh, was in contact with you a couple of weeks ago and sent some pictures as I watched my broccoli get <laughs> devastated. Uh, so I, I did have a couple of pictures, and you've got some other examples here. Yeah. You were able to tell me what happened, what is happening with my broccoli. Yeah, this is a, a very common problem on uh, all the crucifers, brassicas, broccoli, cauliflower, Brussels sprouts. I actually brought leaves of my Brussels sprouts, and they kind of look just like yours, sort of holy. Yep. Um, but this is the imported cabbage worm, and actually yep. I brought, there's a little cabbage worm right well, it's hard to see. I saw it earlier. It's, yeah. uh, he blends right in. Yeah, that's the problem is when right you're, uh, he's right there, there on the leaf is. vein. Yeah. Um, but they blend right it's, in. I'll let you yeah. try to show that. But um, So you need to scout the leaves. But if you start seeing those big holes. These and also, big holes right here that I'm right. pointing at right yeah, now. That was my first right, indication. The caterpillars cause that. As soon as you see those little white and yellow butterflies flying around, that means they're there laying the eggs. And you should watch for those pests. And there's like three to five generations per mm -hmm. season. So mm -hmm. it's a good one because once once you start seeing the damage, if you use, if the caterpillars are out there, if you use the organic spray BT. That's what you told me. Yeah. And, and as I said to you, this is something, it's too late this year, but you suggested that if I'm going to do it again, it's probably going to occur next year. Oh, yeah. yeah. And it's not too late for these smaller larvae. I could go out yeah. with BT now and, and stop okay. further damage. Okay. And again, that's something that I don't have to worry about putting it on, and I can still feed the food in the garden to myself and yeah, my children. Yeah, because it's just going to affect yep. the caterpillar, unless you're okay. part caterpillar. All right. It we have a couple you. of other things, tomatoes, peppers, some other stuff. We're going to come yep. back with you. I'm going to come back over here to Leonard. Uh, a problem plant that you wanted to talk about, and this is uh, an important piece to talk about. Well, it's kind of pretty, Will. You see it all along the roads or in midsummer. Um, I'm not sure how close I want to get, but let's go well, ahead no, and bring it, it, it right won't up really, here. It won't bite. It won't, you know, sting you or anything like that. But this is kind of like the Queen Anne's lace, you know, type flower, but it's yellow, very tall, five to six feet. And that's the wild parsnip. It's basically the parsnip that was brought over from Europe. Uh, the wild version escape is basically like the parsnip we eat. You can eat the roots on this, but um, this thing is very invasive all over yeah. the place. That's why you see it up and down the roads. Um, you have one plant come up. All these seeds here, these are pretty much ripe. They're brown now. These yellow flowers make these seeds pretty quickly. These will then spread and they will colonize a hay field. It's amazing how a tall hay field, these will somehow, they germinate, they'll make a rosette of leaves and here's what the leaves look like all up and down the stem and at the base. When it, uh, it's called, what's called a monocarpic, one fruiting. So once it fruits, it, the plant dies. But all these seeds that germinate make these little plants around, and then they, when they're ready, could be a year, could be several years, will send up this stalk and then make more seeds. So um, what you do to control it is you basically, before it sets seeds, when it's still flowering or just after, you cut it off. Since it makes one fruiting, that's it. That plant dies, uh, and it won't make any seeds. Um, so that's the best way to control it when you're dealing with it or if you're out there weed trimming it, whatever, uh, and cutting it. Be careful the sap, when you get the sap on you and it's exposed to sunlight, it will cause a rash. That's called photodermatitis. 
that's in a field, yeah. and livestock eat it, they can actually get sunburn yeah. because the chemical gets in them. Yeah. So kind of so a very serious a wild parsnip, yeah, yeah to really get after yeah. if, you know, I didn't get after mine soon enough and it's just all yeah. over now. I'm gonna try yeah. mowing the field yeah. a few times, a few years, and hopefully yeah. that'll keep And I know your, your expertise is not dermatology, so I won't push that, yeah. but the point is that this exposure to this on the skin combined with sunlight is going to be a problem. Right, and there are a yeah. few other plants in the garden that okay. can do that too. Now you have another flower as uh, we began to see here, quite popular, uh, and you wanted to pass on some important news about hydrangeas. Yeah, hydrangeas are probably one of the most popular shrubs now, and there's so many new ones out there, and one of the common questions I get is, why did it my hydrangea bloom? Well, they're probably not talking about one of these. There are three main types. There are the uh, panicle types here that are kind of a cone shape. Those are really hardy, and then there's the dome-shaped ones here, and one of the things with this, if you notice, it's one-sided, so I wouldn't enter that in a fair. Probably wouldn't get a <laughs> blue ribbon on that. It's just, you see, it's kind of, you want it real. If it's supposed to be rounded, you want it rounded, but anyway, this is the same type, that, that rounded type the dome, the second type. Both these are really pretty hardy. Then there's a third type of Denbrinks. Mine hasn't grown. Uh, a good example is the Endless Summer. A lot of people uh, have and buy and it doesn't bloom for them. And it's one of those new ones and some of the growers call it Endless Bummer. I, th I say it needs an endless summer to bloom. Um, but basically, a lot of these are bred in the south. A lot of them are uh, fairly tender shrubs. What that means is basically, they, and unlike most of these others that bloom on the current season's wood, those bloom on last season's wood. So what that means mm -hmm. is the flowers formed the previous year. If the stems die over winter, no flowers that year. So that's why they're not blooming. Now if you want to know how to try to baby them along, like tender roses, I have a book here, and this is uh, called Hydrangeas in the North, and it's by a uh, guy, Tim Bobel, who's a nursery manager in Rochester, New York who uh, figured out and has some really good tips in this thin book here about basically these new big leaf types, as you see the pinks and the blues and all those ones that people want now mm -hmm. and can't get to bloom. He has some really good tips in here about how to get okay. those o to overwinter and hopefully bloom. Excellent, excellent advice. Uh, time is flying by. Ann, I want to come back to you, if you don't mind, uh, our friend the tomato here. Yeah, this is a common problem on tomatoes. It's not an infectious disease, but it's called blossom end rot. And what happens is that end of the fruit, the bottom end of the fruit, just turns brown and stops developing. Um, I'm just going to get this out of the way of our okay. director, Adam Wright, so you can put that right up there. Thank you. Yeah, and uh, sometimes fungi can move in afterwards, but a lot of times this is what's caused by um, water fluctuation in the soil, and a lot of times it's the first fruit that has mm -hmm. this issue, mm -hmm. and then the next fruit goes away. Okay. It's fine to eat if you want to cut that yep. off, yep. but uh, it's something that... There weren't any seen. water issues this summer. Oh, I know, <laughs> I know, yeah. Yep. Okay, and also, again, uh, Tomatoes important, they're like a staple, even if you've only got a under the window. The other piece yeah. uh, that a lot of folks are into are the peppers, and you got a, you peppers, got something going on with that. Well, this is one, uh, one of peppers' problems is sun scald, and what happens is if they've lost some leaves or they're exposed to the sun, it can sort of burn a side of the pepper, and then this, uh, you know, you get this sunken area and then fungi move in. So, again, this is a, not an infectious disease, mm -hmm. um, but it, you could cut that out and still use the pepper. And but it's a very the, common problem in peppers. Some of the things that are important to know is that we've put a lot of time and effort, we've grown it, and a little discoloration as long as it's not a major problem. Right. Go ahead right. and eat it. Yeah. Have, all right. Yeah. Uh, uh, the time has flown by here. We didn't get, and I apologize, because we didn't get to everything that we wanted to. Leonard, there is information that's going to be on your website for other uh, flower garden problems. So how can folks access that and what types of things do you have there? Okay, well, yeah, the uh, Perry's Perennial pages, perrysperennials.com or .info will take you. I've got articles and a lot of these topics more like uh, blanching vegetables to get, you know, freeze them before you, you freeze them. Uh, awesome. And, uh, so that's really important. To, again, we've, we've put a lot of time and energy yeah. and effort. And it isn't complicated. Well, I will have to have you back because uh, that's something we need to do okay. before the fall season. And and how can uh, Vermont gardeners get advice, or how can they they get some feedback through the uh, uh, the volunteer master gardener? Right, program? that's a great uh, uh, resource to access. And the um, number it's a toll free number anywhere in the state. It's on the screen right now, and you can uh, call them. They're typically there in the mornings every day, and they'll be happy to help your 
help you answer your garden questions and pest and disease yeah. questions too. Well, you guys have, you're great. It's always a pleasure to have a chance to visit with you both. So thanks very much for coming in. Thank yeah, you, Will. Thank you. That is our program for today. We know you have choices. So thank you for choosing us. I'm Will Michael, inviting you to join us back here each weekday afternoon for another visit across the fence. Thank you.